Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Peter Goddard, Director of the Institute for Advanced Study, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon, this Institute lecture. After the lecture, there'll be a reception to which you're all invited in Ford Hall. Today, our speaker is Deborah Prentice, who is a visiting professor this year in the School of Social Science. Deborah took her bachelor's degree in human biology and music from Stanford University in 1984, and then took her MS, MPhil, and PhD degrees in psychology from Yale University. She joined the Department of Psychology at Princeton University as an instructor in 1988, becoming an assistant professor the following year. She became professor there in 2000, department chair in 2002, and in 2008, was named Alexander Stewart, 1886 Professor of Psychology. Deborah's research concerns the psychology of social norms, how norms arise from and in turn influence perceptions and behaviours in social contexts. Together with Simon Levin and Eric Maskin, she's an organiser of this year's programme in the School of Social Science on social norms and collaboration. Deborah's research and teaching have been recognised by numerous awards, including the 1994 President's Award for Distinguished Teaching at Princeton University. Today, Deborah's subject is behaviour change as a psychological enterprise. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm having a fabulous year as a visiting professor at the Institute, um, and it's a pleasure to talk to all of you today. I'm going to talk today about how to change people's behavior, um, that is, change it intentionally on a, on a broad scale, um, how to change behavior with a specific goal in mind. Uh, this is a very common objective of social scientists and policymakers seeking to ameliorate social problems for, of course, human behavior is at the heart of many of, of our current social problems. Um, so, for example, if people would just stop driving SUVs, keeping their houses so warm, tossing recyclables into the trash, and leaving lights and appliances on, we could reduce our carbon emissions signi significantly. If they would watch what they eat, do their 30 minutes of exercise each day, uh, wear sunscreen, buckle up, and drink in moderation. We could improve their quality of life and, at the same time, reduce pressure on our healthcare system. Um, if they would sign up for and contribute to their 401k programs, take advantage of benefits like healthcare and dependent care expense accounts, and keep their credit card debt down, we could help them make their money go further, and so on. In all of these cases, the solution to collective problems requires that individuals behave differently. They do things differently. Very ordinary, everyday things um, need to change in order for these problems um, to be ameliorated. So how do we get individuals to do things differently? Uh, well, the traditional way to change behavior on a broad scale is to rely on the government to pass laws, um, raise or lower taxes uh, or subsidies and sponsor educational interventions or information campaigns. These are powerful levers. I mean, these do produce behavior change and, and we know they matter a great deal. Um, the problem is, of course, that they're costly, they're enormously cumbersome, um, and they are, they are engineered by a political process that is almost always inefficient and is sometimes ineffective. Um, that said, this kind of approach sometimes works. So let me give you an example, and this is the example I think that always comes to mind for people when they're trying to think about behavior change and when, when have we been successful at changing behavior. Here's, here's a case in which um, most people feel that it, it worked wonderfully well. So um, this, is the, um, this, uh, this graph right here is um, a graph of annual per capita cigarette consumption. Um, from 1900 to almost the present, more or less the present, okay? And as anybody um, my age or older knows, uh, there's been a remarkable transformation of attitudes towards smoking and also a transformation in smoking behavior over the past 30 years or so. Um, cigarette smoking has gone from being incredibly cool and very common to being terribly stigmatized and very uncommon. Um, this graph, so this graph shows adult per capita 
cigarette consumption in literally numbers of cigarettes um, on the y-axis um, since the turn of the 20th century. And the major events in the campaign against smoking here are marked. Um, so it enables you to see the recent fall off in cigarette consumption um, with which everybody is so impressed. And it is impressive. It's really quite remarkable. I actually find two other things about this graph really remarkable. Um, first, I find the steepness of the onset of smoking also really remarkable and, and how much it's yoked to the two world wars, right? So you can see that between, you know, in the, in the 19... You know, mid 1910 to 1920 period, you get a sharp uptick, right? Um, and then a, a reduction with the Great Depression, which is interesting. I'm not sure what, what's responsible for that, but then a, a huge run up uh, up to the end of World War II, and that actually had to do with um, the successful efforts of tobacco companies, um, both to advertise to the masses and also to 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 market. I mean, having a smoke became what troops were entitled to, right? Um, and and somehow they yoked smoking very much to to what we owed our troops for their for their service. Um, so I find that actually really striking. The other thing I find very striking about this this graph and why I put it up here is is what it took to get rid of smoking, right? I mean. It took uh, smoke outs and it took, it took major public health campaigns on the part of the Surgeon General and not just one. I mean, if you see the first Surgeon General's report there, I don't have a pointer, I'm sorry. I'm, that's why I'm pointing lamely here. Um, the first General, Surgeon General's report didn't lead immediately to any, virtually any change at all, right? It took multiple reports from the Surgeon General. It took a broadcast ad ban. It took a, a social movement around secondhand smoke. And actually, most people attribute the, that and then combined with the laws against smoking in public places, the, the recent fall off is largely a, a product of that. Um, so this is the way the, the, the sort of the traditional view of how you get behavior change, this is how it works. And I should say, by the way, that um, for any of you interested in this, I read a great book on this uh, by Ellen Brandt called The Cigarette Century um, that I would recommend to any of you who are interested in the history of smoking. It's a great story. Um, but for every um, success story, there are many failures. Um, and now this doesn't work at all. There we go. Um, of which government-sponsored interventions to encourage sexual abstinence in teenagers are a recent example. Okay? So when Congress overhauled the welfare laws in 1996, they increased funding for abstinence education. And subsequently, the Bush administration increased it further, such that by 2007, uh, the federal government was spending about $176 million a year promoting abstinence to, until marriage. Um, Congress commissioned an independent evaluation of the effectiveness of these programs, and the results came back showing that the programs had absolutely no effect. I, I mean, no effect. And it was very striking. It was reported widely in the media because the percentages that, uh, for all relevant measures, the, the program and control groups had identical, identical means. So for you know, the age at, kids, at which kids became sexually active, the number of partners they had had, whether they used contraception, what kind of contraception they used, all things that the programs had targeted um, showed no difference at all um, by virtue of the $176 million that had been spent. So when this was reported widely um, in the media, I think it, it greatly embarrassed the Bush administration. But spectacular and costly failures like these have, have made people very skeptical about government-sponsored efforts at behavior change, um, you know, a skepticism that, that I think um, comports with the, the more general skepticism people have about government's ability to actually do things. Um, and that skepticism um, has coincided with an explosion of interest in the behavioral sciences, and in particular in what research in psychology and related fields has to contribute to our ability to predict, explain, and ultimately change behavior. Um, and one of the indications of this growing interest was the remarkable popularity of this book, um, Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Tipping Point, which was published in 2000. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have read The Tipping Point? Yeah, I mean, that's amazing. It's really, it's an extremely popular book. It spent 164 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list, so that's more than three years. Um, and I put its cover up here because the subtitle of The Tipping Point, um, How Little Things Can Make a Big Difference, captures the essence of the book's argument, um, which is basically, the, the book is basically a series of stories about how little things matter. Um, and I want to read Gladwell's summary near the end of the book. He says, 
Merely by manipulating the size of a group, we can dramatically improve its receptivity to new ideas. By tinkering with the presentation of information, we can significantly improve its stickiness simply by finding and reaching those few special people who hold so much social power we can shape the course of social epidemics. In the end, tipping points are a reaffirmation of the potential for change and the power of intelligent action. Look at the world around you. It may seem like an immovable, implacable place. It is not. With the slightest push in just the right place, it can be tipped. Okay? And I think that summarizes very well the argument of the book and what people found so compelling. I think people found that argument immensely compelling. Um, and continue to. So a recent book, written very much in the same spirit as Nudge, and there are quite a number in between, um, but um, Nudge, I think, is, is the most recent entry into this, uh, into this literature by Dick Thaler and Cass Sunstein. Um, and Thaler and Sunstein are explicitly concerned with designing interventions to change behavior. Um, they, like Gladwell, see this project fundamentally as requiring tweaks and nudges intelligently placed. Right, so it, it, it's finding just the right lever, um, and it doesn't have to be something big. In fact, it's, it's better if it's a small thing, but the right thing. Um, so they too believe that little things can make a big difference, um, and they too look to empirical research in the behavioral sciences, especially in psychology, to determine what the little things ought to look like, okay? Um, what the popularity of these books signifies, in my view, um, is the rise of what I'm calling micro-level reform here, which is social change pursued not through large-scale interventions targeting laws and markets, but rather through small-scale interventions targeting the immediate contexts of people's everyday lives. Pursued in this way, behavior change becomes a psychological enterprise where the design of interventions are based on insights about human nature that are gleaned from psychological research. Um, so let me emphasize uh, that the, the goal of these interventions is not to change the people, okay? It's not psychology as practiced on a couch. Um, in fact, this approach is quite accepting and even forgiving of people's humanness, right? Of their limitations, um, of their predilections. These interventions do not ask people to be virtuous. In fact, lurking at the back of these interventions um, is the belief that people can't do that, right? People can't be virtuous, at least not all the time, not consistently. Um, what they can be all the time and consistently is people, right? Um, and so what we, do, what we can do is we can take what behavioral scientists know about what people are like and say, okay, how can we organize the world to bring out the best in them, right? How can, how can we, um, how can we, or at least bring out what we want in them, right? How can we um, affect um, change through, um, th through changing the situations that people find themselves in and therefore the way they behave as a consequence? Um, so let me just highlight three features of these interventions that I think are important for understanding their popularity, um, among other things. Um, and that is these, these Interventions are very decentralized. Anybody can do this, right? This is, this is something that uh, local school boards and grassroots organizations and, um, you know, individuals with an idea. Um, many of Gladwell's stories in The Tipping Point are of individuals who had an idea and, you know, figured out how to implement it um, at, at very low cost and, and sometimes even for free, you know. For, so, for example, one of his stories is of a, a nurse who really wanted to get people to have more cancer screenings and mammograms, um, and she was having no luck uh, disseminating her information until she took her campaign into the beauty salon, right, where she had this, um, uh, this uh, ready uh, pool of um, receptive and not to mention trapped um, women. <laughs> Um, and, you know, sure enough, she was a great success. It's a good illustration of the approach where, it, it, so it's, it's not about spending a lot of money. In fact, it's, it's sort of antithetical to spending a lot. It's minimalist. You don't have to do a lot. Um, and it's very, very decentralized. So uh, we can all participate in this, um, uh, but it, it, it can be surprisingly effective, okay? Um, and I should note that the fact that these are grassroots efforts are, is both the good news and the bad news, you know, because there's, there's sort of pandemonium out there. I mean, lots of people are out there trying to intervene, and I'll talk about some of those efforts uh, along the way. Um, 
But the point is that it is very empowering, and I think that that, that sense of empowerment accounts in part for the, the rise in popularity of these kinds of interventions. Um, so let me illustrate the approach um, and its grounding in psychological research. Um, so one thing we know about people is that their choices are heavily influenced by what they take to be or what is given to them as the default option. Okay? Sometimes this is because they're too lazy uh, to make an active decision. Sometimes it's because they find deciding to be stressful or, or aversive in some way, um, as, and deciding is stressful, actually. Um, sometimes it's because they take the default option to be advice from the policymaker or from whoever designed the form, right? Um, and a good example of this predilection, one with important consequences, comes in the domain of organ donation, right? So here in the United States, um, the default is that you are not an organ donor, okay? In order to become an organ donor, you have to fill out a donor card like this one. That doesn't seem like too much work, um, but even though 85% of people say they approve of organ donation, only 28% have actually signed the card. I mean, you do have to get a hold of the card and you do have to, you have to think to do it. I mean, there are at least small obstacles to, to getting this thing done. Um, so how do we know this is that, that this gap in percentages is due to a tendency to accept default options? It, it may just be that people say they support organ donation, but they don't, they don't really, at least not when it's their organs. Um, well, it turns out that, that countries vary a lot in what they use as the default option. So some countries like the US have a no donor default, and other countries actually have a donor default. When you are born, part of you know, being born into a certain country um, is that you are presumed to be an organ donor and you have to take action to opt out. So there are opt-in systems like ours and there are opt-out systems in other countries. And so what we can do is look at the effect of consent rates across countries to see if the defaults matter. And these are the data for a sample of European countries. Um, so that's holding constant some number of aspects of culture, which also make a big difference in this. Um, and as you can see, in the, the countries in gold are the ones with a no donor default, the countries in blue are the ones with a, a donor default. Um, and so in Denmark, the Netherlands, the UK and Germany, they're like us with a no donor default, and then Austria, Belgium, France, Hungary, Poland, Portugal, and Sweden um, have a donor default. Um, and this is a vast difference, um, as you can see, um, that's actually barely diminished by concerted efforts on the part of some of these poor gold countries to up their rates, right? So. Um, the Netherlands had a massive information campaign um, and mass mailing in 1998, which may account for why their consent rates are barely higher than those of the UK, right? But it's very difficult given, you know, starting from a no donor default to get rates anything like even Sweden, um, about 86%, right? Um, so defaults seem to make a huge difference um, and we can design defaults to try to you know, put people in the right cell to start with. Um, this has been proven to be very effective, for example, in getting people to sign up for the retirement plan, the 401k plan um, in their organizations. Making membership in the plan a default option um, greatly has increased um, participation in these programs, which are um, all to individuals' benefits. Okay, so that's an example of a, pro of a, um, a way in which our understanding of how psychology works informs um, our understanding of how to design the world uh, to help people out. Um, another thing we know about people is that they do things in the heat of the moment that they live to regret. Um, people are sometimes short-sighted, um, and they often lack self-control self um, in, in many, many domains. Um, in, in what they eat, in what they drink, and what time they get out of bed. I mean, you name it, right? And I'm sure that many of you are familiar with these self-control problems. Um, one domain in which this comes out is in email, okay? Many email messages reflect problems with self-control. Um, people send garbled messages. They send them to wrong addresses. Um, they forget to add the attachment. Um, they also send angry and harsh messages that they would probably like to have back right after they hit send, or maybe five minutes later. Um, it's just, it's very easy to hit send um, in the heat of the moment. And um, 
that fact is responsible for a considerable amount of incivility um, that goes on, certainly in many organizations. I think um, part of why this example compels me is that I've been chair of my department for a very long time. And as a department chair, you see an awful lot of this. I mean, most of it is not addressed to me, fortunately. I'm merely copied. Um, <laughs> but but there, I, I, can, I can attest firsthand to the fact that there's a great deal of, of harsh email that goes on out there, things that people would never say to each other's faces, right? I mean, it, it just would not happen in an, in an actual exchange. Um, so uh, this is probably why I'm attracted to uh, Thaler and Sunstein's suggestion, um, that we capitalize on advances in automated text processing to develop a program that can detect angry or uncivil language in an email and give people an opportunity to think twice. Because oftentimes, I mean, it really is the heat of the moment, right? Uh, many times, all you need to do is, is read it again, and you think, no, 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 no. Um, so what they suggest is that, in fact, you have this program um, that automatically reads your message. Um, and if it thinks it's uncivil, it gives you a message like this, right? <laughs> um, or better yet, you know, for those of us who, who need more help, right? Um, this is, for the, people, this is be for the people who don't get over it in that minute. Um, Similar suggestions um, actually include imposing a waiting period on divorces and marriages, and I mean, there are some places that have waiting periods um, on, on divorce, certainly. I'm not sure about on marriage, but you know, the goal is to try to get people not to do something impulsive that's going to be, that they're going to regret, and that in fact might end up being hard or impossible to undo. So there's another example. Um, a third thing we know about people is that they are highly social. Um, what they see other people doing exerts a very strong pull on their behavior. Again, this is neither good nor bad, it's just true. Um, we're very social animals. Um, and it is a fact of human nature that both explains behavior and can be used to change behavior. I'm going to talk at some length about this category of interventions um, because I have some first-hand experience with them um, and because I think uh, they're, they're particularly useful in, in um, some domains that I think many of us care very much about. Um, so how can we leverage people's sociality to design interventions for the greater good? Um, one thing we can do is we can uh, mobilize conformity to pro-social norms. Okay? And it may seem counterintuitive in, in, our culture, in our very individualistic culture to think that conformity can be a good thing, but, but in fact, Often, we, of course, we want people to live up to societal standards of good behavior. We want them to conform to what they and everybody else agrees is, is the right thing to do. Conformity is, we couldn't live without it, and it can also be a, a powerful engine for social change. And so one strategy that's been employed is to give people information, right? Give people information about other people, either or both about, about what they do, Right? Because people will conform to other people just to their behavior. Or even better yet, give them information about what most people approve of or disapprove of. So the, the former is, is information about the descriptive norm. The latter is information about what's called the injunctive norm, right? the, the prescriptive norm. Um, and in an effort to try to get them to influence their behavior in that direction as well. Um, and as I say, I mean, human sociality is such that even the, even the descriptive norm, even just information about what other people do, exerts a very strong pull on behavior. So let me give you an example um, of how we can design an intervention that mobilizes conformity. Energy conservation is actually an excellent context for this kind of approach um, for the following reason. People would like to reduce their energy consumption, okay? They, everybody's on board that project in theory. The main thing that gets in the way is that most of the behaviors involved in consuming energy are habitual. They're mindless. We never think about them, right? It, they, they remain sort of unexamined in our day-to-day -day lives. It's very hard to change habitual behaviors that you never think much about, right? Um, so, but at the same time, actually, people do not want to be energy hogs, right? They do not want to be out of line with their neighbors and peers. Therefore, it should be possible to mobilize behavior change by making people aware of their own behavior and aware of the comparison to others, right? Um, and this is exactly what researchers did um, in a field study of energy consumption in San Diego. They partnered with the local utilities company and kept track of household energy consumption via meter readings, right, which are done everywhere. Um, 
they gave people feedback at two time points, and the way they did it was by way of handwritten notes on a door hanger. So you get a door hanger from your local utility company. And that contains some information um, about your own energy consumption, um, the energy consumption of your neighbors, um, and also tips to conserve. Um, and in both cases, it included that information. Um, so there were two, there were actually two different types of hangers. One included just what I just listed, right? It's, it's, I've labeled it here descriptive normal loan for reasons that you'll see, but what, what they gave people was their own energy consumption off the meter readings, the average consumption of their neighbors, and some tips for, for how to do better, for how to conserve. Um, for another set of households, they added to that Injunctive norm information, basically, they just put a happy or a sad face on, and they drew it, right, hand-drawn. So there's, 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 human, there's a human behind this happy or sad face. Um, so if, if people's energy consumption, own energy consumption was below average, they drew a happy face. And if it was above average, um, they drew a sad face. Um, so this is conveying approval or disapproval in a very kind of incidental, but somehow very compelling way, right? Um, and then they came back, so they did this, they had a, there was a two week period and then they came back a week later and measured energy consumption. And then they came back again three weeks later and measured it. Um, so they've got both a, short, a look at short term change and, and long term change, where short term change is one week and long term is, is three weeks. Um, so here is the short term change. Um, and what you've got here, so it's zeros in the middle, right? It's change in energy consumption. So lowering energy consumption um, goes below the midline and, and raising it goes up. And what you can see is that, um, and, and it's the, the slightly darker bars uh, are for people who um, had above average consumption and the slightly lighter bars are the people who had below average consumption. And what you can see is in, when all they got was information about their own consumption and what the average was out there, um, they conformed to it, right? Which included decreasing their consumption if they were above average and increasing their consumption if they were below average. Needless to say, this wasn't quite what the researchers had in mind, but it, but it illustrates just the power of other people, right? I mean, and, and you know what it was. I mean, I can imagine easily being one of those people in the below average group, right? Where you think, oh, I'm doing fine, and you relax, right? Um, and we don't want people to relax, right? What's, what's nice about adding the smiley and frowny faces was that, you know, the, the people, if, if they learned they were below average and they got a smiley face, they, they remained vigilant so that they'd get a smiley face next time. Um, whereas the people who were a, a, um, above average and got a frowning face seemed, look, looked to have tried even harder, although the difference between those two bars is, those two lower bars is not reliable. Um, but certainly the injunctive information took away the boomerang effect that they, that they wanted to get rid of. And at the three-week time, the pattern remained. Okay, so they still got this at the longer-term follow-up. Um, like I say, this captures the flavor of these interventions beautifully, right? It's a little thing that can make a big difference. It's a door hanger, right, with, you know, very low tech with handwritten information on it. Of course, the handwriting is part of the, part of the power of it because it's, it, it suggests that there's, there's actually somebody back there um, and, and, you know, approving and disapproving of your behavior. Um, the practical implications of, of this research are very clear, and they've already been implemented in many places. Um, so, for example, um, the mu this, is, this is from a, a New York Times article just recently. The municipal utilities um, district of, in Sacramento has begun sending out bills that look like this, okay? Um, with the energy consumption, so the, the the, the, you, this is you, <laughs> this is unfortunate you. Um, all neighbors it, are the 100 neighbors um, who live in homes of similar size to you, right? And the green neighbors are those, you know, damn 20 who are most energy efficient, right? Um, and what's interesting is this, is this is now, they give this information to the people who are high consumers. When they first started doing this, um, they put, smiley faces on the good people and frowny faces on the bad people. And in fact, they put two smiley faces on the really good people and one smiley face on the people who were just below average and then frowny faces on the people. Um, but they had to actually stop using the frowning faces because the customers who got them got very upset, 
and called the utility company. It, I mean, it, it, it does, the, the power of that disapproval is, is, is harsh, right? Um, so they actually still use the happy faces um, because they don't, want it, you know, they don't want the boomerang effect, right? They need the happy faces to keep people from increasing their consumption if they're below average. But they stopped using the frowns. Um, and competition between groups also works well. This is something that's been done um, in a number of settings. So some colleges have set up rivalries between dormitories to reduce carbon emissions. Um, and, um, and that's apparently incredibly effective. And then one nonprofit um, in Massachusetts set up a competition. I, this one's brilliant. One, uh, they set up a competition between three communities. So there were 10 families in each of Cambridge, Medford, and Arlington, Massachusetts, um, who um, participated in this competition to see who could lower energy more. And it was televised as a reality TV show on the local cable station. Okay? And apparently, they all got incredibly into it. Um, and overall, there was a 66% reduction in energy consumption across those households, right? Because once they got into competition with each other, of course, they were. And in the dorms, they say, you know, when you put dorms in competition with each other, you have, you know, students going off campus to charge their cell phones. I mean, it, it gets intense. Um, OK. Uh, let me give you uh, another example of how norms can be used to mobilize pro-environmental behavior and also so how subtle the process is, what you see here is a picture of Arizona's Petrified Forest National Park. Um, it is one of America's 10 most endangered national parks, largely because visitors have an unfortunate tendency to steal the petrified wood. Um, I think it's probably almost irresistible to not pick up a piece, right? But the problem is, in 2005, more than a ton of wood per month walked out of the park. Um, and prompted by this state of affairs, park officials put up a big sign at the park's entrance which read, your heritage is being vandalized every day by theft losses of petrified wood of 14 tons a year, mostly a small piece at a time, right? And that's the sort of thing that, that, that one would think to do, right? It is to say, you know, look, look what's happening. Um, people are behaving badly. Um, the important thing to realize is this is an intervention, right? I, I, putting up the sign is an intervention. Um, it's a very sort of normal thing to do. Um, at, but it's an intervention based on intuition, um, and, and probably intuition grounded in the moral outrage that park officials felt um, about this going on. Um, a team of researchers at Arizona State, um, led, I should say, by Bob Cialdini, who was one of our heroes from the door hanger intervention. Um, he, he actually has done a number of these and is extremely good at them. Um, wanted to take a closer and more systematic look at that message, at what exactly it communicated to people and what its likely effect would be on their behavior. And so they got permission from park officials to do a systematic study of how different kinds of norms-based messages affected theft. Um, and they created four different signs, which targeted either the descriptive norm, that is what people actually do, or the injunctive norm, that is what they approve or disapprove of, um, and used either a negative or a positive frame. And let me explain what these were. So. Um, the descriptive norm, so these were signs. They basically made four different signs. Um, and on the descriptive norm negative framed sign, they had the following. Many past visitors have removed the petrified wood from the park, changing the state of the petrified forest. Okay. This is very similar to the big sign that the park officials put at the front. Um, and it was accompanied by pictures of three visitors taking wood. Okay, So this is people taking wood out of the park. Um, the descriptive positive sign read, the vast majority of past visitors have left the petrified wood in the park, preserving the natural state of the petrified forest. You can imagine finding that sign rather puzzling, right? It's like, why are they telling me this? Um, but it was accompanied by pictures of three visitors admiring and photographing a piece of wood. Okay. And then they had their two injunctive norm conditions. So the, the negative one was, please don't remove the petrified wood from the park. Um, and it was accompanied by a picture of a, a visitor stealing a piece of wood with a big red circle and a bar superimposed over the hand. Um, and the injunctive positive was, please leave petrified wood in the park. Um, and it was accompanied by a picture of a visitor admiring and photographing a piece of wood. Um, so what the researchers then did was put 20 pieces of wood along the path leading away from these signs. Um, 
And then after two hours, they counted how many of the 20 pieces were left, counted how many visitors had come through, um, and then rotated the signs, right? I mean, it's, it's brilliantly done. It was really smart. Um, and then waited another, you know, put out the wood, hid in the bushes, <laughs> waited another two hours, <laughs> leapt out. Um, and they did this for five two-hour blocks each weekend, for five weekends at four sites in the park. I mean, they did a, this is a really nice study. Um, so here are the results. Um, what you can note from this um, is that the negative framing is more potent, but it can pull behavior in either direction, right, depending on what you're telling people. And, and people are very sensitive um, to, to negative, they're more sensitive to negative than to positive information. Um, but the key here is whether you're describing what people do or whether you're telling people what they should and shouldn't do. Um, if you tell people that others are taking the wood, they too will be more likely to take the wood. Right? And I, I, I mean, this is really important because there's a, there really is a strong intuition to tell people to stop taking the wood, right? When, when you're morally outraged, you say, look, you know, all hell is breaking loose, right? And what you have to remember is that when you, when you give people that message, you know, they, they'll jump on the pandemonium ba bandwagon. Um, so if you tell them not to take the wood, if you explicitly say, don't take the wood, they'll be less likely to take the wood. In general, if you tell people what to do or what not to do, they'll, they'll do it. Um, so, um, yeah, so the moral of this story is that telling people that all hell is breaking loose is not a good way to restore order. Um, okay, so the examples um, that I've given so far illustrate the fact that information about other people, both what they do and what they think is right and wrong, can be used to get people to behave in pro-social, um, in these cases pro-environmental, ways, um, and it's people's tendency to conform that's the engine that makes this work, right? That's what you're mobilizing here, is people's tendency to conform to anything, to others, whatever they're doing. Um, but of course, sometimes conformity is the problem, not the solution, right? Um, sometimes what we want to do is to liberate people from a concern with others' views, um, and this has given rise to a family of interventions that are designed to free people up um, from conceptions and sometimes misconceptions about what everybody thinks. These types of interventions, I should say, are especially well suited for use with kids from early, early adolescence really through to the end of college because this is a period when people are surrounded by peers um, and they're highly attuned to what those peers are doing. It's, a, it's sort of the height of social influence, if you will. Um, and oftentimes what you want to do is free them up from that um, rather than binding them to it. I mean, what the environmental interventions did was bind people to what others were doing um, by making the information salient and making the comparison salient. But a lot of times what you want to do is to, to break that link. Um, and there are ways we can do that too. Um, one domain in which these norms-based approaches um, have been extremely popular um, is trying to reduce excessive alcohol consumption among college students. So as most of you probably know, college students drink a great deal. Um, most surveys suggest that between 40 and 50% of students binge drink in any given two week period. So that's, that's a lot of, lot of, lot of liquor. Um, and the fact that binge drinking is strongly associated with social anxiety leads people to believe that they're doing it at least in part out of trying to conform, trying to fit in, trying to, um, trying to alleviate social anxiety. Um, um, through lubrication, but also through conformity to, to norms that are going to promote their, their standing among their peers. Um, and what surveys, including a number I've done, have, have shown consistently, uh, you know, across campuses, across space and time, uh, is that college students greatly overestimate their peers' comfort with this behavior. Okay? That is, um, individual students um, express misgivings about the most excessive kinds, most, most of them are moderate. Actually, personal, private attitudes toward drinking are, are all over the map, right? There are kids who love it, there are kids who hate it. The average person is average, you know, is, is moderate. Um, there's great variability. There, there is no real sort of descriptive norm for comfort with drinking, right? Um, but students believe that there is. Students believe that everybody drinks heavily and that everybody's comfortable with heavy drinking. Um, and what that has led to um, is a wide variety of intervention efforts trying to capitalize on that misperception um, and thereby change drinking behavior. And um, most of these efforts have um, taken the following form, um, and it's called, it's, it's, 
it's widespread enough to have a name, the social norms marketing uh, approach, um, and it, it, just to give you a, a sense of how popular it is, about 25% of campuses have some kind of social norms marketing program around alcohol use. Um, so it's, um, again, it, most of these programs, a lot of these programs, the, the typical thing that you do is you put up posters that look something like this. These are actually, I, this poster um, uh, I, th I thought was sort of clever, which is why I use it. Um, many of them are, are less um, sort of visually interesting than this one. I especially like the gender information embedded here with the, um, with the other information. But um, what these, what these Campaigns try to do is to correct people's misperceptions of the norms, right? So people overestimate the frequency and extent of drinking, and they and they overestimate people's comfort with drinking, um, and they then conform to those overestimates in their own behavior. What if we correct them? What if we show them that in fact drinking to excess is the is not the norm? Uh, it's it's a fairly uncommon behavior. Um, and and there and then they won't feel compelled to do it either, and you know people disapprove of it. Some of the some of the uh, posters use injunctive norm information, um, and and then we can welcome them to the majority, as it says, right? We can um, we can mobilize conformity, if you will, but to a more moderate norm, uh, and therefore they won't drink as much. At least they won't drink to excess. Um, there, there are, there's a, a, now a, a very large literature on this. I should say that, that many of these efforts are you know, conducted by student health groups. Um, somebody will hear about this research and some kids will print up some posters and put them up. And, um, and so um, it's a fairly uncontrolled world out there. Um, and then even fewer programs actually do any kind of empirical follow-up so that you can see how they're working. Um, but in the literature, at least half of the published results from these kinds of programs show either null results or actually some of them show a boomerang effect. And you figure if half of them are showing null results, given that it's virtually impossible to get null results published, um, there are a lot of unsuccessful campaigns out there. Um, so it, this highlights some of the limitations of this approach, which I'll actually get to in more detail later on. Um, but we had a different idea. Um, that rather than trying to correct the norm to which people are bound, right, we could capitalize on the fact, as I just said, that in fact, if, if you ask people how they feel about drinking, there is really no norm. People's views are all over the place. Um, and um, what we really want to do is not get them to conform to something more moderate, um, but free them up, liberate them from feeling like they've got to conform to fit in in the first place. Um, so that was the approach we took, actually. Um, a student of mine, Christine Schrader, um, and I did an intervention at Princeton um, in which we um, had two types of discussions among first-year students in the first week of classes. Um, in one set of discussions, um, the focus of the discussion was the gap between social norms and private attitudes. And, and that gap is so consistent and so reliable. If you ask students, how comfortable are you with the drinking habits of students at Princeton, and how comfortable is the typical or average student or most students or your friends? In uh, you know, 75 to 80 percent of people will say that others are more comfortable than they are, right? So it's a terrific tool for interventions because you can actually give them the questions and then show them their data, right? And it's a great way to stimulate discussion. Um, and versus the control discussion, we had students talk about uh, designated drivers and planning ahead and all kinds of more individual-centered um, strategies that they could use to control their alcohol intake. Um, and what we found, we did a, a follow-up four to six months later um, in, in which we collected self-reports of their drinking behavior. Um, and what we found was that the discussion of norms reduced drinking for both men and women. I've broken them out here because invariably you always get higher rates of alcohol use by men than by women. Um, but the intervention was, in fact, equally effective. Um, and this is just a simple simple um, analysis of the means, but even using more complicated um, analyses where we controlled for various things and so on and so forth, um, the intervention was actually surprisingly effective, reducing alcohol consumption by about 40%. Um, and th the additional evidence we collected suggested that it, that it really did work by liberating people from the norms, right? That what putting them in a discussion setting where they talked about their own private views did was 
free them up from, it was A, get them to appreciate how varied people's views were, right? The fact that there really was no, no norm, right? And it freed them up to act in accordance with their own attitudes, whatever those were, right? We did not get people to stop drinking um, by doing this, nor did we actually intend to, though it did have the side benefit of making students who did not drink, abstinent students, feel more comfortable with that choice. Um, but in fact, what the intervention did primarily is reduce very heavy drinking among students high in, in fear of negative evaluation, which is exactly what you would expect if what you were doing here was diffusing the power of the norm to, to compel them, right? Um, another domain, a, a very different domain, in which a similar kind of approach has proven effective um, is in interventions designed to reduce um, the gap in academic achievement between African-American children and white children. Um, so African-American children perform less well in the classroom on average than do white children, even after one controls for socioeconomic status, family background, and other factors that one would expect to matter and that do matter. Um, and one source of this poorer performance is a phenomenon known as stereotype threat. Um, so what is stereotype threat? Stereotype threat is, is the, the threat one feels when one is at risk of confirming a negative stereotype of one's group, okay? So stereotype threat is what African-American um, students feel in academic settings because they're negatively stereotyped there, right? And if they perform poorly, they're just feeding into that negative stereotype. Um, women experience it in math classes um, where they are negatively stereotyped. College basketball, football, and hockey players experience it in academic settings too um, because they're negatively stereotyped, you know, sort of big guys experience it, big, big male athletes experience it um, in academic settings. Um, and white guys actually experience it on the basketball court if, they're, you know, if their race is made salient, right? If, if, if somehow your behavior is going to, to feed into a, stereotype, a negative stereotype of your group, it, it, the consequence, you, feel, you experience stereotype threat, and the consequence is, of course, that you perform more poorly, right? Which is why this is, there's, something terribly ironic and self-fulfilling about this. Um, so one way to improve performance by members of stereotyped groups is to reduce stereotype threat. And the way to do that is by um, giving them an opportunity to affirm their values. Um, this is called it's a, an affirmation um, intervention. And um, this intervention technique has proven to be remarkably powerful um, at liberating people from all manner of negative norms and stereotypes across a wide number of domains. It's, it's surprisingly powerful. Um, so let me tell you about what I consider to be the most impressive demonstration of this. Um, this was a study on uh, reducing the racial achievement gap. So it was conducted with about 250 seventh graders from middle to lower middle class families, half of them European American and half of them African American. Um, and they conducted the intervention as closely as possible to the start of the fall term. Um, it was presented as a regular classroom assignment. Kids in class got an envelope with uh, a set of materials in it. They sat in class for 15 minutes, filled them out, put it back in the envelope, sealed it up, and gave it to the, you know, the experimenter, and that was that. So it was very, very minimal. Um, and what was, in the, what was in the envelope, what they did um, was they, they were presented with a list of values, okay? So, you know, what do you care about? And they were things like relationships or being good at art or, you know, things that seventh graders would care about. Um, and they were asked to do one of two things, okay? Either they were asked to choose from this list the one to three most important values to them personally and write a brief paragraph about why those values are important or they were asked to choose one to three least important values and write a brief paragraph about why these values might be important to someone else, okay? So it's a very similar task, right? But in one case, you're affirming yourself, affirming your own values, and you've got this opportunity to, to present your own values. And in another one, you're engaging in some hypothetical exercise about why people might value things that you don't. So these are graphs taken from the paper. Um, I'm not sure how easy or difficult they will be to see. Um, what this is, is this is the mean grade point average at the end of the fall semester, okay? Um, and it's broken down. So if you look, the, the graph includes raw means and error terms on the left-hand side, and then covariate adjusted means and error terms on the right-hand side. Um, and it's broken down, African Americans in the control condition are the, the first bar, the white bar to the left, African Americans in the affirmation condition are the black bar, European Americans in the control condition are the second white bar, and then European Americans in the affirmation condition 
um, are the gray bar. Um, and they've broken it down along the x-axis um, by whether the kids were low performing, moderately performing, or high performing the prior year, so their, their level of performance. Um, and what you can see, and then the covariate adjusted means and error terms adjust for that prior year performance, okay, statistically adjust for that in the analysis. Um, and what you can see is that the affirmation manipulation had significant and positive effect on performance for the African American kids of all abilities. Um, note that even high performing African American kids did better than control African American kids once the covariates were adjusted for. Um, and um, it had no effect, actually no reliable effect for the European American kids. It didn't, and it, it didn't eliminate the whole gap, but it actually did have a, a significant effect uh, across the ability spectrum. You know, remember this was 15 minutes in the beginning of school. Um, so it, it, and this is what I mean, these effects are sort of, they're sort of astonishing um, effects. Um, for one of their, so th this is an aggregate of a couple of different studies, and, and for one of their studies, they actually tracked performance over time um, to get more information on, on exactly the nature of the effect, descriptive information on exactly what it looked like, right? So these are trends in performance, actual trends in performance on classroom assignments across 10 time periods, okay? And they've broken it down now into just three groups of students. There were, there were no differences for the European American controls and affirmation kids. So those are lumped together, and that's, those are the sort of diamonds. And then the African American control are the open squares, and the African Americans in the affirmation condition are the triangles. Um, and what you can see is that there's, there's a downward trend overall, sort of a very general downward trend overall. And, and keep in mind, this doesn't mean that they just get worse as the semester goes on. I mean, the assignments could get more difficult. Part of that, a lot of the variability is probably how difficult the assignments were at each performance block. Um, but what you can see is that if you compare the open squares to the triangles, um, what you can see is that the affirmation intervention seems to halt the slide for African American kids, right? So without the intervention, they decline more rapidly than white kids. With the intervention, they sort of level off in the middle. They experience an initial decline that's comparable to what happens in the control condition. And then they level off. Um, and um, what's amazing here is that you can get these kinds of differences uh, by simply having kids spend 15 minutes affirming who they are and what they value and trying to explain them. You know, and, and I think this is plausible. What the, what the authors argue is that, that what these trends suggest is there's a, there's a cycle, there's a, a kind of re recursive negative um, feedback loop, right, between threat and poor performance. You're threatened, you perform more poorly. It makes you more threatened, you perform more poorly, right? Um, and so what they argue the affirmation manipulation does is essentially intervene in that process. And that's why you, what you get is, is mainly a halt in the downward, the downward slide. Um, so this is a good example of a little thing making a big difference. Um, and I should say there's more work to be done on this. I mean, I show it to you because I think it's very, I think, I think this is about